Good evening. How many do we have online? 30 online and a room full. I would say this is an important topic. Welcome, everyone. I really appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, I know this first meeting was short notice. I apologize for that. My objective was simply to get going. And I know that that didn't make it easy on some, but based on our attendance, I think we're doing okay. <coughs> no, this isn't the last opportunity. I just wanna say there's a couple more community meetings scheduled and we'll probably do a virtual only meeting. I haven't picked a date for that. I'm gonna give you plenty of lead time and I'll add that one on there. First, my name is Chris Dorrington. I'm the director at Montana DEQ. Uh, why are we here? First, I would say we're here on purpose. We're here to have a conversation and we're here to listen. And it's because wisdom comes from a multitude of counselors. I think many times people have said, those folks at Helena, they sit in the agency and they think they know everything. Well, I don't know everything. The intent for us is to talk a little bit about the Montana Environmental Policy Act. And tonight, Rebecca is going to share just a quick down and dirty of what MEPA is and what it does. So we're all on the same page. And then the objective is for all who would like an opportunity to be able to come to the podium and share thoughts in a, in a respectful way, in a kind way, and tell us what is important about MEPA and what can it be done better? Should it include more thoughts? Should it include more ideas? Should it remain exactly the same? Should there be things that are simpler and things that are made more complex? We're looking for ideas. We're looking for solutions and an openness to the idea. If you guys will simply accept, and I ask you to hear me in this, accept that we're trying to do a really good job except that we're open to a set of ideas that might modify what we currently do. That's why we're here tonight. I could easily just stay in Helena and I'd rather be at home watching something on television, but I'm not, and I won't be. I'm here in this room to listen to you. There's room up front too, if you'd like, there's five or six seats with your input. Plus the input from other sessions, plus the public input for that which we have online. So we have a website with a comment portal. You guys are welcome to do both. Provide comment here, plus in the portal online. The ideas and the comments, I hope, based on my past experience for complex topics like this, I think they'll bend into buckets. They'll be lanes of commonality. Here's what MEPA is and here's what it needs to be. And with those ideas and with those comments, what I think we are able to do is pass it on to a work group who distills those ideas into a set of recommendations. Recommendations for both the executive and the legislative branch to consider. Because what I know, what I know, I've lived, I've lived this is that the legislative branch and the judicial branch don't agree. And I'm in the middle attempting to implement a law, set of laws, so that I can remain protective of Montana's natural resources and do so clearly and consistently and tell everyone who has a stake in what we do very clearly what can and will be done. And that's the sum of it. And so with that, I will pass this off to Rebecca. We'll take us through a short conversation and then we'll move on to the evening. Thank you again, sincerely. I appreciate that you're here. I know you've invested time. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody for being here. 
As Chris said, my name is Rebecca Harbage. I'm the Public Policy Director at Montana Department of Environmental Quality. I'm really happy to be here with all of you tonight. Happy to have you here with us. I'm going to just run through some really brief bullets about MEPA, the Montana Environmental Policy Act, because I recognize that we may have a lot of background implementing this law and we may be very familiar with the statutes and the rules, but I do not believe that every single person in the state of Montana is as enmeshed in those laws as we have to be because of our jobs. So I'm going to keep it brief because I want to make sure that we have as much time as we can to get to the public comment. If you have questions, please follow up with me. Um, I can leave a bunch of business cards on the back table and I would love to chat with anyone who wants to talk to MEPA in the future. So what is MEPA? To begin with, MEPA is basically a process at its most basic level. It's a process through which state officials are required to analyze and then share with the public the potential impacts of an action before we make a decision on how to act. It's a, about state actions. So what is a state action? Unless something is specifically excluded under MEPA, any action that the state takes, any decision that we take may be a state action. So that includes things like issuing a permit to an application that we have received. It also includes things like providing funding to a project. Um, those are examples of state actions. So MEPA applies in all of those cases. It's not limited to DEQ. I think that's important to note, even though you see DEQ here tonight and DEQ is leading this process and this conversation, MEPA applies to all state agencies and state actions taken by those agencies. MEPA is not permitting. So I mentioned that MEPA applies to our decisions about a permit, whether to approve or deny a permit or modify a permit, but it's not the same thing. So permitting begins and MEPA begins when DEQ receives an application to build some facility, let's say. Um, we begin a process of reviewing that application under permitting laws and statutes to see if that application meets the letter of the law and is protective of the environment under permitting laws. MEPA is a separate set of laws that requires that as we go through that decision making on the permit, we're looking at the potential impacts that may be outside the scope of what that particular permit will limit this facility to, to do. So permitting is where you might find things like limits on particular pollution that could come out of a smokestack, for example, or limits and standards for wastewater that get discharged into waterways. That's all in permitting. MEPA is about information, it's about research, and it's about public input and public disclosure. MEPA is really about taking a broad, hard look at those impacts. And I know a lot of folks here it referred to as look before you leap. MEPA is truly about making sure that state officials and decision makers understand what the potential impacts might be before we move forward and approve, deny, or modify a permit under permitting statutes. A little bit about MEPA implementation. You may be familiar with some of the phrases that you'll hear tonight or that you heard leading up to this meeting. What you see generally as a member of the public is an environmental assessment or EA or an environmental impact statement or EIS. Those are the two main documents that we produce under MEPA and that's the way that we share the information about environmental impacts with the public. Typically those get published for public comment, we get a review period, and we take those comments very seriously because as the director said earlier, we recognize that we don't know everything. And oftentimes there are local experts who are more familiar with the situation on the ground where this project might be proposed than we are sitting in Helena doing our work. So we really want to hear comments from the public who are, who are familiar with the site and who are able to give us some more perspective as we go through this research. So I said MEPA is a public process. It's a public document. That's what ends this MEPA process. We produce some sort of a public document, whether that's an EA or an EIS. We publish that on our website and we accept public comments and welcome public comments. And then we take those comments into consideration when we then move from a draft document into a final document. So that's where there's a public comment period. And then you may see those documents and that analysis change based on what we heard from public comment. That was really brief. That is MEPA in a nutshell tonight. I hope that helps to set the stage for folks who weren't as familiar coming into the room. 
Uh, but I do want to keep us moving forward in the interest of time, because really tonight is not about us, but it's about hearing from you and hearing the perspectives and ideas that you brought with you tonight. So before we jump into the listening session, I just want to cover a few ground rules. And this is common for any public meeting, right? We, we want to make sure that we're having a respectful dialogue here tonight. Uh, this is not a debate, it's a public discussion. Um, I recognize that there are many different perspectives represented in this room, and my ask is that we be respectful and we listen and try to maintain an open mind as we listen to all perspectives being shared tonight. DEQ is really interested in hearing all of the ideas, the entire spectrum. That doesn't mean that we are going to move forward and immediately implement what we hear tonight. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a popularity contest where if we hear the most of a certain idea, the state will just do that. So your opinions are all very valuable and we take them all very seriously. I do wanna mention this is not the place, not the venue to comment on specific projects. As I mentioned earlier, MIPA has public comment periods outlined as part of the statute. If you were here to comment on a specific project that's under review, I would encourage you to please make sure you're submitting your comments through that particular public comment period to ensure that they are reviewed by the permitting staff who are working on that review. We want to hear from as many of you as possible tonight. And like the director said, well, we now have 45 people joining us online. Um, I understand we have probably over 20 in the room who have indicated that they would like to comment. So understand that we will be trying to limit the time allotted for each person. And that's mainly so we can get through as many as possible. So I would ask and request that folks try to share the air in the room. Let's try to get through as many commenters as we can tonight. Um, and also understand this is not your only or last opportunity to weigh in. So I understand this is the meeting that we are having in Billings, but every one of our listening sessions has an online option. I would encourage you if you think of something else in the future, or if you don't have a chance to comment tonight, or maybe you're not ready to comment tonight, please join us at a future session, whether that's in person or online, we would love to hear from you. There are also postcards that were being handed out at the door that have a QR code. You can scan that with your camera on your phone and that will take you straight to our online public comment portal where you can submit your comments online. And we would definitely welcome those as well, whether you comment tonight or not. That's it. So we're gonna do a little tallying. Yeah, I think we'll add the six. Yep. Just based on the numbers, it looks like we have probably, oh, okay. We have 20-ish in the room that'll want to speak. 22, okay. Will those online who would like to share a comment tonight, raise your hand just so we can count the number of individuals who would like to speak? So we'll limit we'll limit comments for four minutes. If you would, because we've been through this, if you would at the four minute mark, which will give you a mark, please conclude. And that just is respectful of someone else who wants to share another four minutes. Kind of thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll go, uh, well, there's only two online right now. Okay, that's okay. So let's start online because that will give us those two and then we'll focus on the room and go back. Uh, so we'll begin online. I'm sorry. If you would raise your hand, then we'll call on you in order that you raise your hand. All right, we'll pivot to the room then. <laughs> and I, I have no care or concern about who goes first or last. Uh, as Rebecca said, your comment is a useful value in this room and I appreciate your time. Uh, and let's go. I could call him someone, who do you have first? Katie Harrison. Right 
Do you mind? Well, okay. Is it on? There's a little red switch there. Hello? All right. Well, Mr. Director and members of the DEQ, thank you for convening this. We do appreciate it. Um, although it was short notice, and uh, we're, I'm hearing a lot of feedback from folks that this was a pretty tight turnaround in terms of being able to get people here and calendar everything in. Certainly my comments were just written up a few minutes ago. Uh, I'll be submitting something a little more technical in the coming weeks as the process moves along. Um, in terms of MEPA and its importance, it's probably the most important bedrock environmental law in Montana. It is essential for public decision-making. It's essential for environmental decision-making. It's essential for public participation. So I think it's critical that if you're considering any changes to it, that you do so with that in mind. As you noted in the release that you had, um, MEPA was created in the 1970s. However, there's been some radical changes since that time. It's not like MEPA came about then, there has not been changes. There's been a number of legislative sessions and some really major radical reforms, certainly the one that happened in 2001, as well as the reforms in 2011. And some of those reforms, well, I can tell you, I went back through a, a set of newsletter articles and news stories on it. And they were characterized, characterized as modernization, streamlining, updating MEPA, very similar to what we've seen out of the agency thus far for this process. And that really turned out to be a euphemism for cutting the public out of the process and limiting environmental reviews and the scope of the environmental review. And that's what we're concerned about. Um, we want to see this process result in greater public participation and a more robust environmental review process. As an example, in 2001, the environmental impacts associated with the project agencies were limited in the issues that they could look at. In 2011, legal remedies for citizens and organizations were eliminated. And that's important because there has to be a consequence if DEQ or DNRC fails to do its job under the law. Now, I've, I've heard today that certainly MEPA is not a permit, but it's not meaningless. It is a critical and bedrock process, and it serves to inform the public. And so without that robust review, it can be really problematic. Um, so getting on to some of the changes that uh, we'd like to see. And again, I'm gonna detail these in more length. Analyze climate change and analyze it now. There's nothing in the law preventing you from doing so today at this point in time. And that means uh, taking a full evaluation of the greenhouse gas impacts associated with projects um, and doing an alternatives analysis. There are established scientifically accepted methods out there today that you guys can glom onto the most popular being the social cost of carbon. There's a number of guidance documents and research papers out there that detail that process. There's now robust case law on that process. Um, if you're not familiar with it, what it is, it is a graduated price on carbon, looking at the costs to society from continuing to emit greenhouse gases and evaluating that through time. As time goes on, those costs become even more immense. Um, additionally, there needs to be some better uh, public processes. You have 20 seconds. Okay, some better public processes for notice and comment. More people need to be engaged. I oftentimes see environmental assessments that don't have an environmental notice or excuse me, a public no notice associated with them. That's a problem. I'm not saying every single EA needs to have a public notice process, but that should be analyzed. Timelines for environmental reviews. I've been involved in a process in which there was a timeline and it didn't serve the applicant. It did not serve the public in relation to the hard rock mining law. Some of these timelines are just um, unworkable and unnecessary. And so with that, I'll, I'll follow up with some more technical comments. I don't want to take other people's time. Thank you.
Oh my goodness, how with Knife River? Welcome, sir. Good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, address uh, this, this group this evening. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to be in the minority this evening. But um, when, when I got the notice about uh, making comments about uh, the NEPA process and what should be changed or should be considered to be changed, the main thing that I was concerned about was the recent uh, rulings in the, uh, as far as considering uh, climate change and uh, global warming in the permitting process. Until there's a way to actually measure the uh, impact to, uh, or, uh, you know, any way to measure the impact of, of, of climate change global, uh, warming to a project, I don't see how it can be implemented. Until that point, uh, I, I'm just very skeptical that it could be um, somewhat uh, uh, arbitrary, if you will, until there's a scale from one to 10 or 10 to 100 or some way to measure the impact. So I, 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 I would be very careful in considering that, uh, that into the process. A couple other things is when we talk about uh, the impact of an action, which is part of the MEPA process, I, I think we should also think about the impact of not implementing an action, okay? There could be projects that, that, that do not get built. That's a loss of jobs. Uh, we could be, uh, 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 have the inability to provide adequate energy for future needs. Uh, we could be forcing uh, 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 dependence on foreign adversaries to produce the components that we need to advance, especially the electric vehicles uh, for, for uh, uh, that, that helps satisfy the, the whole uh, climate change process. And, um, you know, there's the potential for increased costs to infrastructure that, that will make it uh, hard to meet. <clears throat> Everything that we produce for infrastructure, whether it's uh, concrete, aggregates, whatever, um, you know, that's what we need for our infrastructure. And if we're not allowed to produce those or produce them at a, at a reasonable cost, then people's roads, buildings, everything deteriorates to the point that they're unusable. So there has to be some balance there, is, is my point. Um, I guess that would be the main things that I would I would like to point out this evening and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, Al. I didn't say thank you, but I appreciate your welcome. Representative Dunwell, we'll go online. Thank you. H hello, hello, Director. Um, oh, let's see. Am I thank you. We can see you well. Thank you. Here we go. Okay, hello, Director Dorrington, um, members of the public. I'm Senator Marianne Dunwell. I represent uh, Helena and East Helena in the state legislature. And I, um, again, threw together a, a comment. Um, and I I do appreciate, Director, that, you jumping, that you're jumping on this um, because it deserves the utmost attention, especially after the outcome of the Held v. Montana um, Youth Climate Trial. That uh, uh, that 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 demands um, in permitting that the department consider climate impacts, the public health implication, the the whole gamut of climate climate impacts. Um, I'm I'm here to uh, encourage you to continue the protections that NEPA um, gives us. It's the people's law. It provides that the public, Montanans, can weigh in on their clean and healthful environment, which, as you know, is a constitutional Montana constitutional protection, and as well as the right of participation. So this marries the two, which is um, which is so important. Um, 
and deserves um, honoring and continuing. Um, I, as a legislator, I, I am required by the Montana Constitution under Article 9, Environment and Natural Resources, to provide for the administration and enforcement of the protection and improvement of a clean and healthful environment. Um, it says that, that, that I, as a legislator, shall provide adequate remedies for the protection of the environmental life support system from degradation and provide adequate remedies to prevent unreasonable depletion and degradation of natural resources. And that's what I'm doing tonight, weighing in to say, please honor MEPA as it has existed for decades um, and served Montanans well in the permitting process. And please honor what's happening with our climate, that we need mitigation, we need adaptation, and we need prevention. Um, and that can happen through MEPA. So I, I think, uh, I think that's all I have to say tonight. I'll probably have a lengthier comment to give later. Thank you for the time. Um, Barbara Chilcott. Welcome, Ms. Chilcott. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening. Um, Barbara Chilcott, I'm a senior attorney with the Western Environmental Law Center based in Helena, Montana. Um, I've also uh, worked for the state as an attorney for five years as well. Um, during that time, I advised the NRC on the implementation. Um, currently, I represent clients um, on MEPA-related issues, litigation, policy matters. Um, tonight, I'm here as a practitioner. Um, and um, with the experience working with MEPA and also with the, um, the experience representing clients in, in addition to the um, organizations here tonight and uh, the youth plaintiffs in the healthy state uh, case. Um, I'll be quick, but the, the two things I want to say um, about MEPA is in this process, we do, um, or I ask you to look at strengthening MEPA um, as much as possible. Over the past um, many sessions, um, MEPA has been gutted by the legislature. And uh, in most cases, in many cases, uh, the courts have found those uh, that legislation um, or has invalidated that legislation on constitutional grounds. The purpose of MEPA is to implement Montana's constitutional protections um, for our clean and healthful environment, as, um, as well as others. And we just urge that um, the agency here and the state as a whole uh, move forward in, in uh, restoring NEPA. Um, and I would like to disagree with the fact that, or with the statement that NEPA is separate from permitting. Um, the analysis that happens under NEPA should inform permitting. And indeed, the state of Montana, DEQ, can deny permits when a MEPA analysis demonstrates that uh, environmental harms would occur um, that are unconstitutional, as the court found in Healthy State. <clears throat> MEPA could serve, MEPA could and sh should serve as an umbrella statute to uh, work through the permitting process under which um, the agencies can work together and coordinate different permitting for different facilities. Um, and finally, um, I'd like to talk about specifically about climate. Um, as the court in Healthy State found, um, DEQ knows how to do a climate change analysis. Um, DEQ did it before 2011 when um, the MEPA limitation, which was uh, just recently found unconstitutional, uh, passed. And DEQ knows how to do that analysis now. The science is clear. We have experts in state, um, many of which testified during the trial that DEQ can uh, rely on to inform your process for analyzing climate change <clears throat> and greenhouse gas uh, impacts. Um, the harms occurring from climate change are happening now and DEQ has an obligation to move forward as quickly as possible um, now to analyze those impacts. Um, that's what the court said and held. 
that's what the state of Montana um, needs. And the people in this room um, are being harmed right now by climate change. And so our position is that a work group is not necessary to um, inform or to tell you how to do a climate change analysis. So we ask you to really look at the science and move forward as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chilcott. Next up would be Kenneth Brown. Welcome, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Hello. Um, I just had a general question regarding it. You know, I wasn't familiar with exactly what you guys were going to talk about. My concern is the Yellowstone right now with that latest rail spill. And it seems like every time you watch the news for information, you, it's like the DEQ doesn't know where the, the contamination is coming from. Is, is that what I'm getting? And um, I know from being from Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh, I know what it's like to have rivers that's been polluted, air you can't breathe. I've been there, lived there, you know, my childhood years. And um, I can tell you right now, there's no way you want a river like I had, like the Allegheny, Monongahill in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You don't want that to where you had open sores that dumped into the river, where you had feces and numerous other things in the river. I don't know about you guys. Um, I don't fish for that reason. It actually turned me off from fishing because of rivers the way they were, the way people treated them. And um, my brother who happened to work for the department of DEQ in Pennsylvania, took me out many times as one of my work brothers. And I got to see the mine seepage. The water was clear, but it was loaded with heavy metals. You know, there's no way anyone could drink that water. And um, I see that same thing happening here. Is if you allow this to happen here, you're going to regret it. Um, pretty much, I, and one of the other deals, just to make it real quick, I don't know why we can't determine on exactly what's getting in the river. I know even in Pennsylvania, they were able to, not only did they have records of everyone who stored any toxic waste along the river to where they can dump in, they were fined right away and they actually knew what they had on in storage on their sites. They knew who to go after, who to find, and prosecute these people back there. I mean, personally, I don't know why that can't be done here. If you're not sure it's the asphalt that got dumped in the Yellowstone, and you think it's some other materials, someone's dumped it there. So that's my comment for you guys. And for everyone else in Montana. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Brown. Appreciate that. Jerry Kiltz, looks like. Did I say that correctly, Mr. Kiltz? You did. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I don't know why I don't have anything prepared or anything, but uh, I just feel that this is such an important subject and such an important agency to we've got montana a, a reputation for an area that's relatively unspoiled just as the, the last commenter commented uh, there are places that uh, were spoiled 100 years ago like there in pennsylvania and our pollution for the most part is a little bit more recent, although of course from the mining, you know, a hundred years ago, a lot of that was cleaned up, but we've, um, it's so important. We can't get back what we lose. Uh, we can try, we can 
do and I'm sure the you know the rivers that he was talking about in Pennsylvania have been brought back to a certain extent, but they're still not what they originally were. And so I just think what you people are your responsibility is is a large one. And it's to keep a state and and not, of course, not just for Montana. There should be a wall across the nation in the world. But in the face of climate change and all the other um, uh, all the other aspects that are seem to be affecting us much quicker than most of the experts have predicted ten years ago, it's on us. And so again, I think that DEQ as well as other, as well as other agencies that are have similar responsibilities have a big responsibility and need to act on it. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kiltz. Uh, Mr. Craig Jones, online, please. Welcome. Director, this is Senator Asp. I'm not Craig Jones. I don't know how I got turned into Craig Jones, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm online and I and I um, was there in 2001 when we passed uh, House Bill 473 that clarified that MEPA was a process and wasn't a regulatory tool of the agency. And I don't know, maybe we've changed it since then. I was going to look at a document to try to find that out, but it was 175 pages, so I didn't get through it. Um, you know, and you would know, your agency people would know, but I'd be willing to bet that the most waters in Montana are cleaner than they were 30 years ago. I would be willing to bet most waters in the nation are cleaner than they were 30 years ago. And that's a testament to the work we've been doing and continue to do, but we do that through permitting and we do that through other things. We don't do that necessarily through MEPA. MEPA is a process by which we gather information. Um, and so that's my two cents worth, Director. I appreciate the chance to talk and uh, look forward to the continuing this process in the future. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Rob Byron, please. Welcome, Mr. Byron. Hey. Thank you, Director Dorrington and DEQ staff for this opportunity, I think. <laughs> I'm a physician. I've lived in, uh, in practice in Southeastern Montana for 30 years. Um, during that time, I have been witness to the worsening impacts of air pollution and climate change, most importantly on the people under my care, but also by personal observation and also through extensive review of the scientific literature. On your webpage, Director, you say DEQ stands behind the intent and purpose of MEPA. And we also recognize that regulatory frameworks require updating to account for the experiences over the past 50 years. And Ms. Harvey, you're quoted in the Daily Montana as having said that as a science-based agency, we want to make sure that what we're doing is a science-based analysis. And so I appreciate those comments, but I also find them quite ironic because during that same 50 years, um, the, the evidence that climate change and the air pollution that's causing it lead to premature deaths and significant adverse health impacts on everyone, especially children, pregnant women, and the fetuses and the poor is absolutely overwhelming. Additionally, during that same period, the sensors, the tools for measuring that and analyzing it has also expanded dramatically and as well as the steps that we can take to reduce current and future harms from air pollution and climate change. Now, I, I would like to respectfully disagree with the gentleman from Life River and with all due respect to his comments in that if somebody walks in to see me as a physician, 
I can't tell them which pack of cigarettes is going to cause their heart attack or their cancer, but I can assure them that smoking is going to increase their risks of death, much the same as air pollution and climate change does. We can't point to a specific person that is going to be impacted during a heat wave or by a wildfire or by air pollution, but we can, with overwhelming evidence, say that more people are dying because of it and more people are having adverse health outcomes. So going back to my original statement, thank you, I think, uh, DEQ already has the tools and scientific evidence to determine the climate change impacts associated with any given project. In fact, Director Dorrington, you said that under oath. I do believe, would ask if you could analyze, if DEQ could analyze climate impacts in the MEPA process, you stated, I do believe we could do this kind of analysis or words to that effect. Thus, there is no need for DEQ to wait for stakeholder group to apply preponderance of evidence that's already available related to climate change and air pollution for permitting decisions. Further delays in applying these tools and evidence only put more people at risk at, for preventable deaths and illnesses as inappropriately approved projects become entrenched as they even threaten people's lives. Thank you, I think. Thank you for real. Appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, uh, Bailey Desper, you kind of marked one. You, I'm not compelling you, but you're welcome to come up. So, welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just kind of want to touch some topics on uh, climate change here in Montana, um, especially, you know, as being like the younger generation kind of growing up in Montana. Um, I feel that, you know, the need to address the issue is, is huge. Um, you know, we had... Um, we have the net the means here in Montana to be able to create more sustainable resources like uh, natural wind, uh, hydroelectric dams, and solar power. Why aren't we organizing and building those kind of resources and infrastructure to you know better sustain and you know defeat this issue of climate change? I think that if we wait by the um, you know until it's too late, like it's saying in your notes, right? Like 202050 or 2050, sorry, um, it's going to be it's going to be too expensive to be able to kind of revamp and kind of kick back and fix the issue that we're at stake here. Um, but I just feel like that's the important issue in my heart, you know, for the, um, the generations coming up. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Karen Walsley. Welcome, Ms. Walsley. Thank you for this opportunity to address you and the crowd. I grew up in Billings, Montana, and my father was a petroleum engineer in petroleum and refining all of his adult life and all of his career. And he went <laughs> on to develop dementia as a senior. And so the idea of air pollution as it relates to cognitive impairments is of special interest to me. And I believe there is research out there correlating air pollution and dementing illnesses, particularly, as the physician mentioned, those populations, but also elderly women are particularly apparently prone to the potential effects of air pollution. So it's, a, it's an issue that's personally very important to me. In terms of what changes or modernization might be helpful for DEQ, I only have one suggestion. And that is the only thing I believe you need to do is expand public rights and participation, which have declined over the years. It's been mentioned 2011, that became a time when corporate and uh, industry interests really seemed to take hold and the public seemed to be shut out. MEPA has been refined, modernized for 25 years. I believe wholeheartedly you all know how to do it. You have the skills, you have the ability, you have the knowledge to go forward now. I don't believe you need collaboratives. I've been on many collaboratives myself. I 
don't think you need to do that. You don't need to have working groups. You know how to do it and you're able to do that now. So my recommendation, go ahead now and comply with the court decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walmsley. Linda. Oh, what didn't we get? Linda Hilo. I think that's right. Did I say that right, Miss? Halo. Halo. Miss Halo, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, one thing that I have great concern about is the semantics, the term streamline. Um, that to me doesn't mean um, thoroughness. That means we're trying to cut something down, speed it up, get through it. And I think these issues are important enough that we need to be very thorough about it. Um, public in, input is crucial in this. Um, I've worked with other planning processes where ground truthing has been diminished to the point that it's simply inaccurate. And I don't wanna see this here. So I think public input is crucial. Um, we need a timeline where public input can be allowed. You have the science, please use it. Thank you, Ms. Hilo. Scott Hancock, looks like a question mark. Yeah, I'll pass for now and submit uh, more substantive written comments when I get into it a little more. Mr. Hancock waves off. <laughs> Ms. Lily Morris. Welcome, Ms. Morris. Um, I'm from Billings. Um, I have a degree in. They just want to. Your mic is off. Think, no, it's yeah. not. It just, for anyone speaking, you just have to eat the mic, and it's it, it's it's tough when you do that, but you just gotta go as close as you can. And you can move it. All right. Um, there you go. All right. All right. Um, I'm Lily. Um, I'm from here in Billings. I have a degree in environmental science from Western Washington University. So this is a pretty important topic to me. Um, I'm going to have to change up what I'm saying a little bit here. So bear with me. But um, I do know I heard about that uh, the DEQ is looking to not include um, analysis of climate change impact, climate change um, when it and it's analysis of proposed projects. Um, I think it's important that we look at that. I mean, climate change is a growing, growing concern um, facing the whole the environment and its people here. Um, also, I think it'd be important to, sorry. Um, it's important to have more public feedback. Um, over in Washington for their Washington SEPA processes, they have public forum for every single analysis that they have for their environmental impact statements. And I think it's important to look at possibly doing that here too. If it's, because I don't think that's being done already. Might be wrong on that. Um, but I do think overall here in Montana, we have a really unique opportunity um, in approaching environmental concerns because we do have a lot of undeveloped land compared to other places within the United States. Um, and less pollution too. And I think we really need to look at what's going on in other places so we don't follow their steps and make the same mistakes and then have to work our way back, be a little more proactive as we move forward. Um, then I guess another one I just wanted to bring up is looking at land development. And I'm not sure where that falls in the NEPA process and how much is included in that, but we are doing a lot to harm the things that will help us in the face of climate change. I mean, we're covering up, we're tearing up our um, natural plant species, so grasses, sages, um, sedges, um, shrubs and trees that, you know, that are suited to this climate and uh, help hold water in the soil. And that's really important as we face heating up climate that's drying out. Um, and we're covering them up, those areas up with concrete and, um, lawns and those both have higher runoff of harmful materials and 
reduce the amount of water held in the ground. Um, so to whatever extent that can be covered under MEPA, I think it's important to look at that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just gonna finish there, but thank you for listening. Thank you for your comments, I appreciate it. We'll go online to Tracy Gibbons. Yeah, hello, uh, Tracy Gibbons, president of Gateway Conservation Alliance. Um, in light of the brand new Center for Large Landscape Conservation Study that shows the most critical habitat and travel corridor on 191 north of Gallatin Canyon, I don't understand why MEPA does not have the authority to stop industrial open cut mines from being placed in these sensitive areas and within residential neighborhoods throughout Montana. Um, I disagree with the Senator's statement that water is cleaner now than it was 50 years ago. If that was the case, the Gallatin River would not be impaired from the sewage that is being leaked into it by resorts south of here. Um, part of this process uh, at the DEQ meeting that was held here, we were told that the MEPA um, study that resulted from where this particular mine would be being placed would have no impact on the permit process. Um, what's the point then? Uh, in addition, I agree with the other statements that were made that uh, there's not enough notification, there's not enough public input. Um, without people like me and people like my organization putting awareness out there, people would never show up. And I feel like that is intended to be the case. I come from Washington, D.C. I know exactly what the gentleman from Pennsylvania is talking about. Uh, the Potomac River, the Anacostia, the Allegheny. The, the fact that we in, in Maryland, in D.C., Virginia, Pennsylvania, those rivers were impacted simply because people didn't care. I'm seeing that happen now here in Montana. And I moved to Montana not to change the way people live or the way people do things. I moved here because it was still pristine. And I'm slowly, slowly seeing that degrade because MEPA and DEQ have been stripped of their authority to do things. So as we look at MEPA and attempt to modernize it, I am concerned that our state legislator, our governor and other officials are not on the same page as MEPA. Um, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gibbons. Back to the room. Mary Catherine Dumphy. Welcome, Ms. Dumphy. Thank you, um, Mr. or Director Dorrington. Um, I am not an expert on MEPA. And I, you know, because this hearing came up with such short notice, I barely had time to get on the point. But um, I received an email today uh, from the Montana Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate. And it said uh, that there are now 11,000 new HEPA filters in Montana schools, thanks to the Department of Public Health and Human Services, as the control program. So over the past years, uh, the Department of Public Health and Human Services uh, asthma control program has been able to provide 11,000 air filters to schools. These filters provide spaces in our schools where air is clean, especially for students and staff with respiratory difficulties. During wildfire season, um, they, these filters cannot purify the entire school, but they are of great benefit. So when I read that, I realized that I knew I was coming here tonight, and I thought, well, uh, something in we MEPA is not working. It's been on the book for 50 years, and our schools are having to have HEPA filters installed for students to have, and teachers to have clean air. And, um, and I wondered what the cost of all these HEPA filters was, um, and it seemed like if we were doing a better job of implementing MEPA, the air would be cleaner and uh, students wouldn't need HEPA filters. <laughs> um, so whatever is not happening as it's currently written, and I'm, like I said, not an expert, something obviously needs to be changed or implemented. 
Well, the other thing I, I want to comment on is, um, I think it was Durf, um, I forget his last name. Mr. Johnson, Durf Johnson. Johnson. Durf Johnson of NEIC. He mentioned the a social uh, costs of uh, carbon. And uh, knowing that I was coming here today, I, I did a little research this afternoon and found out that some of the um, social costs of climate change include, but are not limited to, changes in net agriculture production, uh, human health effects, property damage from increased flood risks and natural disasters, disruptions of energy systems, risk of conflict, environmental um, migration, uh, and the value of ecosystem services. I went to the White House website, and it turns out federal agencies have been working for many, many years on all of this. And those agencies include the Council of Economic Advisors, the Council on Environmental Quality, Department of Agriculture, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Energy, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Interior, Department of Transportation, Department of Treasury, Environmental Protection Agency, National Climate Advisor, National Economic Council, Office of Management and Budget, and Office of Science and Technology Policy through various administrations. And yet, our air continues to get worse and the carbon numbers keep going up. I think we're at 417 parts per million right now. And, um, and the natural disasters keep happening, not just here in, you know, in the US, but all over the world. I don't know if you watched the news last Friday, but um, New York City was hit by a, basically an environmental bomb, a water bomb. And so I'll conclude by saying, um, please pay attention to what scientists, climate scientists are saying, of the intergovernmental panel of climate uh, scientists and uh, implement the, the judge's verdict in the Hill trial and start stopping this disaster that is ongoing and affecting more and more people all around the world, not just in Montana. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunphy. Ms. Priscilla Bell. Welcome, Ms. Bell. Well, greetings to everybody. Can you hear me? All right. All right. I'm here tonight because I have no confidence that the DEQ, along with other government agencies, are going to be able to adequately protect the environment of Montana. Since the Clean Air Act of 1970 and the Clean Water Act of 1972, a variety of individuals and groups have systematically sought to undermine those regulations because those regulations cost money, time, and effort. Individuals and corporations would rather just do what they wanna do without facing any consequence. There's tremendous pressure and money behind those who would soften these laws. We heard the legislators say, yeah, we, we found out that MEPA doesn't really have any power. We, we let them know that. You know, it's just, what is it? I heard somebody say, what good is it? I live in an area already suffering from air pollution, Laurel, from Laurel, Montana. And now the Laurel, Laurel methane plant is currently underway without a permit. That's just astonishing to me. And no one, no one from the higher ups has said a word. The Yellowstone Valley will suffer even further pollution. The DEQ is responsible specifically to make sure that kind of suffering doesn't happen, at least from my point of view. The DEQ is to thoroughly investigate the ramifications of such projects before they start, not after they get going and then we find out how bad it is. Several from my community made the long trip to Helena to confer with the governor and the land board regarding this plant. They were each given a minute each and totally ignored. And I've been to all, all of these hearings that I've known about 
And I just feel like we are all completely ignored when it comes to the environment. The carbon producing industries are, as we speak, working the whole nation to have every state pass laws that prohibit individuals and nonprofit environmental groups from suing states and government watchdog agencies. Lobbyists are pushing state governments to label concerned citizens like me who do protest as environmental terrorists, having them arrested and charged with felonies for protesting. Lobbyists push for laws that are trying to shut down these voices are saying, wait a minute, what's going on? Corporations do not want us to be heard. Like many others, I grew up in Montana. I see Montana as beautiful. And I too have been to Pennsylvania. Let me tell you, it was a very eye-opening experience. Montana has a beautiful environment it can become a leader in clean air, water, and energy. I am here to encourage you to do just that, to make sure that those concerned with the use and health of our land, waters, and air quality are a part of the decision-making bodies. The, our voices need to be on the decision-making bodies and that the Montana Constitution be diligently and explicitly followed regarding the support of a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to speak. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Tom Cheetah. Welcome, Mr. Cheetah. Hello, thanks for... Yeah, thanks for knowing how to pronounce my name. I'm uh, I'm not related to Brad Cheetah, but I am related to Paul Cheetah. <laughs> That's how I was so good at it. Yeah. I'm here with my mom, Carol, and along with my stepdad, we're ranchers and small business owners in Bridger, Montana. I'm speaking for myself, as well as nephews and other future generations who couldn't be here, hopefully to take over our farm someday. Thank you for having these sessions and the opportunity to comment. And I think it points out an important part of the MEPA process to preserve, maintain, and, and uh, uphold. I'd ask that the process please respect a robust, expanded public participation process. I'd also ask that to make sure MEPA contains a strong and accurate assessment of costs, especially of greenhouse and impact on climate change. I think we obviously already see some things in our business. Uh, droughts affect hay prices, flooding in Carbon County, air quality affected by wildfires, and even climate migration affecting agricultural land prices and ultimately food costs. And I think we're also we'll ultimately see impacts to homeowner and property insurance, as you see in Florida and California already. And I think we'll see that here too. And lastly, I just feel strongly that the DEQ through MEPA should respect the real science of climate change and the real effects and avoid undue influence from industry. I understand that the DEQ has the ability to do a real climate analysis now, but you've heard from other folks on the science and process of that already. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Cheetah. Mary Fitzpatrick. Welcome, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Director. I've uh, lived in Billings for 40 years, and I served on the governor's Climate Change Advisory Committee in 2006-2007, and on the EQC for three terms. Uh, so I, this is not new for me to be concerned about climate change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was established in 1988 and put out its first report in 1992, states that we must cease greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 to avoid going beyond the 1.5 degrees centigrade of, uh, of warming. Uh, we're not quite there yet, probably at 1.1, 1.2, and we're already seeing horrible effects. Uh, yet the DEQ and the fossil fuel industry continue to build facilities that must, that must operate well past 2050. Montana is not too small to count and these facilities are not too small to count, as the HELD decision makes clear. We need a full EIS for fossil fuel projects. Over their lifetimes, these will cause 
millions of tons of greenhouse gases. Therefore, MEPA should require an, a full analysis of the life cycle of all these projects, including construction, fueling from the wellhead or mine uh, operations, maintenance, uh, methane leaks from wells all the way to the combustion. And these greenhouse gases need to be accounted for by NEPA. The intergovernment IPCC tells us that stopping fugitive methane is the low hanging fruit for addressing and, and stopping and slowing climate change. And we need to go after it with a MEPA analysis to tell us just how much gas is leaking from every project that seeks permitting. All fossil fuel projects create excess deaths and health costs uh, and disability due to air pollution. There are also financial and social costs on the public. Witness the destruction of neighborhoods by fires in California and here in Montana, the loss of insurance, the loss of neighbors and communities, jobs and schools. These costs amount to cost shifting from industry to the public. We need to describe these costs in advance before a project is permitted. MEPA is our tool for doing this. There needs to be expanded opportunity for public participation. Three days notice looks and feels like gamesmanship, whatever the intent. There needs to be, there need to be more meetings adequately noticed for more personal participation. Not everyone has Zoom access. And unlike the industry, private citizens cannot pay for a constant presence in Helena. Any changes to MEPA should be in the direction of more public input, more comprehensive and accurate and quantified analysis of the social, financial, environmental, and health effects of the fossil fuel industry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christine Glenn. Welcome, Ms. Glenn. Thank you. I'm short. <laughs> but powerful. Yeah, I want to say, first off, that I support business and industry, but I'm also a proud and person that was reliant on our constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. That is so important. I lived in Billings in the 70s and the 80s when you couldn't breathe, and it's not that way anymore. And I don't want it to go back that way. So you asked about what changes are needed to modernize MEPA. I would say, I know you're focused on the, the constitution, but I would just say, make sure you're really looking at the intent of the law, not the letter of the law. As someone with asthma who lives in Billings, I was very, very interested and concerned about the methane plant in Laurel. And my first real experience with the DEQ was going out and reading your environmental assessment. And I saw comments from the public about greenhouse gases and the response was that we are not required or we're not supposed to, I don't know the exact thing, but we, you know, we don't assess those, so never mind. And I'm like, well, wait, but the EPA has standards for greenhouse gases that come from cars and, and vehicles. And it's like, you can't have greenhouse gases that are harmful from cars because they say their problem with them is they hurt their public health. That's one of the main things is they hurt the people. But it's so you have to stop it from the cars, but it's okay from industry. That doesn't make sense. So how can you not have to check it from all sources? It's like, you know, we all know sewage is bad and you can't say that houses can't put raw sewage on the street, but industry can. I mean, we all know that wouldn't happen, but it, that's the same kind of thing that I feel like to me is about the greenhouse gases. Um, so another change I think that's needed in MEPA is I believe in ingenuity and creativity. And I would like to see everybody stop fighting about the way we used to do things and insisting we have to keep doing it the same way. I feel like we are stuck in a rut going, we got to do it that way. That's the way we've always done it. That's where we get the most money. That's what we got to do. We don't care about, you know, there is no climate change. There is no this, there is no that. But really, if we could work together, if MEPA could encourage and promote creativity and ingenuity and reward those things, industry and the people of Montana could work together to find solutions that work for, for everybody. And Montana, 
I think can be a leader in this. We have we have the people. Let's let's be a leader. We've been a leader in so many things. So MIPA could set the stage for that. So I really support that. From the question about what should the greenhouse gas assessment include? I'm not a scientist. I don't know, but I just I would like to see the amount. You know, you gotta say the amount of emissions that it's gonna have, but then put that in some type of equivalency that a normal, typical Montana can understand. Like say two million tons a year. I don't know two thousand. X, a y, a y, I don't know what it is, but put it into terms that like, oh, it's the same as a car or 3 million cars or two cars or whatever it is. Just put it in some terms that we can kind of wrap our head around and visualize. That helped me a lot with the methane plant going, oh, this is what they're doing. This is how much air pollution is coming downwind to me with asthma. Great. Okay. And then opportunities to be more thorough. You asked about that. I would look for balanced representation from all the primary stakeholders in environment and industry and everybody else. I don't know who they are. I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, but I just want balanced consideration of the inputs from everybody. It feels like industry has been winning and the Montanans are not. We keep speaking and we keep speaking and, and, and it's just like, like, okay, thanks for coming. And then, yeah, good, you guys win. And it's like, but wait. Um, so, I would also ask those stakeholders who come, anybody who brings data, no matter where you're from, that your data should be correct. And you should be expected to be transparent and thorough and honest in what you're providing. Oops, sorry, I'm almost done. Um, and let people know that their data is going to be looked at by unbiased third party experts. And if they cook the books, so to speak, no matter who they are, let there be consequences so that they actually bring what is true and correct to you. Thank you so much. Sorry for going over. Thank you, Ms. Clay. Steve Crum. Mr. Crum, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Director. Uh, I'm approaching uh, about two years in a fight against a DEQ permit that was uh, written for the methane plant, plant in Laurel. And when you look at what MEPA is supposed to do and you uh, read through the EA that was written to permit that plant, that is, it's like they weren't even combined. They never even looked at the same thing. But what I hear, uh, from what you guys are saying is that that was, you know, deeply uh, dug into and looked at and, and considered when writing this permit. But if you read this permit, it, it's it didn't do what it is supposed to do, what you would think it would do based on NEPA. The uh, an EA is for like say in a residential area. If you want to move your your fence out to the side of the street, then uh, you do an EA. It's something small, something little. Power plant is not something small, something little. You guys allow them to go forward with this plant with one permit, which is the DEQ air permit. And it was just an EA. Why was an environmental impact statement done? That's what MEPA would have required if you would have been looking at MEPA and following what it is truly saying is that you are required to look for the, look out for the health and welfare of all of the people in the area, not just the financial position of a company that's looking to make money because uh, that's what they need to do for their stockholders. My daughter lives right across the river from this and because they're not within 300 feet of this plant, then they're not considered. This is a massive plant, this is huge. And when you read the EA, even that indicated that you weren't really looking at the rules. It's like the game was rigged, uh, the rules, the regulations, the city ordinances, the county regulations, state laws weren't even followed. State law requires that a locally, majorly circulated paper would announce that uh, uh, this plant is gonna be built here. And then when you guys have your 30 day uh, waiting period uh, or, or comment period, that all the people could speak up. None of us knew that that even happened. None of us knew. We should have known. We should have required you to make sure that that company sent notices to people that live close to it and not use the 300 foot residential rule. So that, that was very disappointing. I mean, even the city says anything bigger than, uh, you know, just moving a fence or, or 
building, to put a rock sculpture out in your front yard, uh, anything bigger than that, you should expand your, your area. I have, what we're doing here is, is we're risking the health and welfare of our future. My granddaughter lived right there. There's all kinds of things in this permit that just are not right. Mother Earth is already barking at us and she's barking really loud. And MEPA is what is supposed to help us fix that. And we're not doing anything. So any reassessment of MEPA with the way things are right now will be primarily controlled by business. And the people that you're impacting by writing an EA like this, that is still out there in midair. They don't even have that now, but yet the construction is still going. Uh, it is going to be controlled by big business. It shouldn't be just them, like previous people said. Everybody should be involved. When you're trading 175 megawatts of green energy, wind energy, for 175 megawatts of methane producing power that emits close to a million tons of, of uh, uh, off gases, greenhouse gases, uh, then it should have been looked at closer. MEPA should have been driving this and EIS should have been done. Uh, the, the plant is also classified as a major source of hazardous air pollutants. The only thing I'd like to, add, I would write, like to ask a question here, why wasn't that addressed in the EA? The only thing it said in the EA was that formaldehyde will be in the, in the uh, gases coming off of it. Well, that, it's a major source of hazardous air pollutants classified by the DEQ yet it wasn't even addressed in the EA. It just didn't seem right. It seemed like the game was rigged before it even started. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crum. Tony Kresik. Did I do all right? Close? Very close. <laughs> Joni Kresic, and I'm from Livingston. Welcome, Ms. Kresic. Um, thank you for this opportunity, and we're, we're counting on our voices uh, actually carrying weight. Um, our democracy rests on our participation, and our citizen voices matter even more when critical decisions are hanging in the balance, and that is the case with all fossil fuel projects and their greenhouse gas emissions. And a bit more on democracy. I really appreciate that um, you have voiced the fact that all voices in this room matter. All of us believe that. We believe in democracy. We believe in hearing each other. But every voice is not of equal weight. If 50 of us testify in one direction and two in another, we don't want to walk away and know that those two are going to carry the day. It needs to matter when we amass a big bunch of people to say a particular message. We want that heard and we don't want to be told we heard you and then see no action. So it's not democracy if a bunch of people, the majority, have voiced their opinion and we don't see action that reflects that. The DEQ must include a complete greenhouse gas analysis and analysis of climate impacts. And both of these need to include a full cycle analysis. These critical analyses should encompass construction, operation, maintenance, use, consumption, storage and transportation of fuels, goods and services, all of it, all of it, because all of it impacts our lives. All of these analyses are there to protect all of us and particularly our youth. Um, they're there to protect our right to live on a healthy and flourishing planet. You've heard a lot in testimony about the impacts of climate change. They're hitting every living thing on this planet. It's also our deepest responsibility to protect the well-being of our youth. That's not in any law book. That is a sacred responsibility. And 
I really would like you to step up to that. You need to put them and their future in all of your analyses. And then last of all, we are getting hit by impacts that no one foresaw. About 16 months ago, Livingston, Montana was hit along with many others by the Yellowstone flood. No one knew that was coming. No one was prepared for it. Livingston, Montana is not whole yet. Some people will never be whole. These impacts are coming so fast and so furious. We do not have the resources. We don't have the human resources. We don't have the monetary, res monetary resources. We need you to, to, put, a, to put up a, a hand to stop further pollution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson again. <laughs> and you've already been referenced as a commenter. I appreciate that. He waves off. <laughs> Adela Honor. You'll have to get me on that one. Thank you. That was correct. Thank All you. right. Welcome, Ms. Honor. Thank you. Uh, I, I live in Billings. And uh, first, I, I'd like to say thank you for holding this listening session, this opportunity uh, to listen to all of the people in this room and also to collect comments. Um, one of the ways that I would like to see MEPA strengthened is through more citizen participation, more opportunities for, for citizens to be part of the whole process. And I think just by looking at the people in this room, it, it's evident that there's very much an, an interest in this. Um, one, of, one of the things that I think most Montanans are, are proud of is we can, we, most of us consider ourselves the last best place and one of the reasons that that has been true is because our constitution mandates a clean and healthful environment and the Montana Environmental Policy Act is, is there to help implement that constitutional requirement. Nevertheless, what has been happening, especially over more recent years is the ability of, of citizens to participate is being diminished and, and gutted and, and not just by limited opportunities, but by the voices of citizens being minimized in relationship to other, other voices, which have been carrying more, more weight. And, and that, needs, that needs to change. There not only needs to be more opportunities for citizens to participate in all these processes, but citizens need to, to be listened to. Uh, the, other, the other thing I would urge as you, as you consider strengthening MEPA, there, there's, a lot of input that's that's been given already. I agree. It's 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 a bedrock of a, of our state. But what also needs to happen in the meantime, as this MEPA process continues, is that the DEQ needs to start like tomorrow, looking at climate change and climate change and and pollution from fossil fuels needs to be closely looked at and seriously considered in, in every single project that comes before the, the DEQ when it comes to uh, EAs and EISs and the whole permitting process. 
Montana, what we do in Montana matters. Even though we're a small state, it still matters. Every little bit matters. No, nobody gets to, to say what I do doesn't matter. It's not that important. Every, everything is important. And the more time goes on, the more it's important. And it, the, Judge Seeley in the Hell case said that Montana needs to start looking at and considering in all your analyses, climate change. It's affecting all of our lives and it's, a, it's affecting our state. It's, and it's affecting us um, as it's diminishing our, our last best place status. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Jill Hickson. Welcome, Ms. Hickson. Thank you. Yes, Jill Hickson. I live in Billings. I live along the Yellowstone River. And Director, thank you for coming. Um, and I do apologize because I am not addressing NEPA, but I feel <laughs> it would be remiss if I did not ask you for some of your local DEQ to give us some informational session, sessions on the long-term impact to the Yellowstone River ecosystem from the oil spill. Um, something more than don't eat the fish. <laughs> and then I would respectfully request that you take information back to the Montana Department of Justice, that they hold Montana Rail Link fully accountable um, and not just a slap on the wrist. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hickson. Next, Greg Childs. Welcome, Mr. Childs. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the DEQ, thank you for hosting this and for all you members of the audience to be your attendance. I've lived in uh, Laurel long enough to remember blackout curtains during the big war. I was told the city council was afraid that Nippon was going to come over and bomb the Laurel Leaf refinery. Well, obviously that didn't happen. It became the Farmers Union. It's going to be kind of hard to separate the DEQ suggestions, the request for suggestions and current events. So bear with me, please. My concern is that your sentiments may be, may be more closely aligned with big business than they are with the citizens of Montana. That's not completely unusual, considering you have significantly more contact with lobbyists and big business than you do with individual citizens. This forum is certainly a, a pleasant uh, exception to that. Thank you. The perfect example of this lobbying is the steamrolling that Northwest Energy has displayed and continues to pursue in building the Laurel methane plant. Their lobbying efforts were on display when Montana legislature passed a number of last minute bills protecting these big polluters. With the recent held court order, and you now, meaning you now have to uh, consider climate change, That provides you with a new stick to support healthy environment and align yourself with our constitution. So my suggestion is, this is the time your agency can show backbone and stand up to these polluters and lobbyists, your children, grandchildren, 
then the Montanans will be grateful and remember your contributions and resolve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cuts. Uh, Mr. Evan Fritz. Welcome, Mr. Fritz. Thank you. Um, I know many of us want to get to bed, so I'll keep this as you know, brief as possible. But anyway, I believe that it is, it is imperative that the short and long-term impacts of you know, greenhouse gas emissions are considered when doing you know, environmental impact statements or whatever, whatever it's called. I mean, we've, all, we've already seen the impacts of you know, climate change here. Like, I don't remember any of the wildfires during my childhood or even my teenage years, which was just a mere 20 years ago, being anywhere near as bad as what we've seen these last you know, couple of years. I'd also like to say that, yeah, the DEQ has stated that, you know, they have the ability to do, you know, analysis on you know, climate change impacts now, and I think they need to do so immediately. I mean, as much as I respect the opinions that, of the people in this room, I don't think you're going to learn anything, you know, too meaningful from us. I mean, yes, you should hold these meetings, learn what you can, but in the meantime, act with, act on, you know, with the information you currently have, you know, to the best of your ability. I mean, that's, that's the best we can, any of us can do, right? Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fritz. Steve Charter. Welcome, Mr. Charter. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for coming down. I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, so I ranch above an underground coal mine north of here in the Bull Mountains. And I've seen uh, very significant impacts from that. And uh, because of the situation I'm in, I think it's very important that uh, MEPA is thoroughly uh, enforced. And, uh, you know, the idea was is that before you do a major project, you really look at all the impacts and then you try to figure out how to. Uh, mitigate those. And one of the promises of MEPA and uh, the other laws was that agriculture and mining could coexist. And I think it's possible that they can coexist, but under the present situation and lack of enforcement, uh, it has become impossible for me to coexist uh, the coal mine. Um, MEPA was designed specifically to balance the playing field in favor of citizens due to past abuses from extracted industries. We have seen that responsible balance slowly eroding over time so that the scales are tipped in favor of industry over citizenry. For example, in the Bull Mountains, through all these years of mining, in the area, a full and complete environmental impact statement that truly examines how this mine could seriously affect the water sources has never been done for the Bull Mountain Mine and is only now, only now being done now. The original environmental documents are from the early 1990s. Through the next 30 years, each new action that either a federal or state agency had to complete simply tiered off one of these. This is truly a piecemeal approach based on incomplete and outdated information that was and is undoubtedly stale. In effect, this approach has meant that the required hard look at the potential environmental impacts of this mine, as well as all foreseeable direct and indirect effects has never been done. This put landowners like myself in a precarious situation where we are seeing the following impacts. Every water source in the Bull Mountains that has been undermined uh, has been affected and none have a permanent water replacement plan besides a plan that will be develop, developed on 
final bond release, which could be 30 years from now. Um, When DEQ does develop temporary water replacement plans, they often do this without consulting people on how much water they will actually need to water their cows. DEQ has often not taken seriously landowners' concerns when water sources have been impacted. This in combination with the piecemeal approach to analysis of impacts to water creates complete uncertainty for our ranch. We have not been able to ranch in the Bull Mountains this summer, and I had to liquidate my cattle due to the uncertain water supply. When expansions to existing projects are proposed, state agencies need to more holistically evaluate the impacts than through a piecemeal approach. To effectively evaluate any major action, it must be considered within the context of the entire project. Additionally, DEQ needs to more broadly consult with landowners when it comes to assessing impacts from mining to make sure that the intent of MEPA, which is meant to protect the right to use and enjoy private property, is upheld. And I, MEPA is not anti-industry. In fact, it's what makes people be able to accept industry. And, and when uh, industry isn't held accountable, that, that's when people will resist these projects. So in order to have uh, the industry that we need, we need to build that trust that they will be held accountable. Um, and then just the final thing is uh, climate change does affect agriculture and it has an economic effect. And I think that needs to be given equal consideration to the, uh, uh, that the industry is giving for, for their contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Susan Berg. Did I get your last name? No. Oh, is that Bo? No, it's German. Bug. Oh, Bug. Gotcha. My, I didn't know if it was a U. That's my fault. I'm sorry. Miss um, Bug, thank you. You would be one of the first who got it right. So <laughs> don't feel bad. Uh, yes, I'm Suzanne Bug. I'm here uh, representing Northern Plains Resource Council. I live in Red Lodge, Montana, and I am on our oil and gas task force. What changes, if, if, if any, are needed to modernize MEPA? Come up and be part of the modern world. 60 years ago, we thought cigarette smoking was wonderful and it was on TV, it was ads were everywhere, everybody was smoking, it's the greatest thing there ever was, it'll make you a wonderful person. And now we realize that was entirely wrong. And we're looking at the same thing with a lot of other things in industry, the things that we didn't think were a problem are now becoming a huge issue. And what MEPA needs to do is look at what's happening now and become part of the modern world. Look at the science and use it. Use it to make us a stronger state. There are so many things that have such long-term consequences that we never realized in the past. As a member of our oil and gas task force, I have seen one of the things that has happened is the fact that we now have a lot of wells which are either shut in or very low producing, but we have no idea what's coming out of these wells. In other states, there have been studies done, particularly in Pennsylvania, where these wells are a major emitter of methane. Methane is 80% stronger climate change warming than carbon dioxide. But we have no idea what's happening. And this is just a small example of what's happening in many industries. We build something and we don't look at what happens 20, 30, 50, 80 years down the line. We assume everything is wonderful until it's not. We look at the huge number of jobs, look at all the money it's gonna bring into the community. 
and then that industry goes away and the community is left to figure out what the hell are we going to do with all this now? How are we going to how are we going to clean up this mess? And there's there's nothing to do it. We have no bonding. We have nothing that will cover it. And this is what NEPA needs to do. It needs to take a long term look at what's going on. We have things that happened 50 years ago. Look at the copper mines. Look at those sorts of things that we're still trying to figure out what to do with. This is what NEPA needs to do. They need to not look at the immediate amount of money we're going to get. They need to look at what the long term cost is, particularly of health. We cannot say how many people are impacted by asthma, uh, reproductive issues. These are all costs that go way a long time. It's not only the amount of money, but it's the, the human cost. Having a mother who can't take care of her children because she has an asthma attack. We have all of these things that we just don't think about. All we're looking at is the money. Oh boy, we're making more money. Not how much it's gonna cost in the long run. And I'd like to close with saying, don't forget our indigenous people and those who are, are in some way impacted, whether it be with a disability or with low income, these are people that need to be considered. We have numerous reservations in our state and these people need to be considered because they can be severely impacted and they have little or no voice. Thank you. Aaron Steens. Steers? Again, it's an, it's an R, it's an N, I apologize. It's okay. It is, it's Karen Steers. So Steers. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Steers. Yes, and, and thank you, Director Dorrington and staff for holding this listening session. Um, yes, it was short notice, but I hope that this means that you are going to jump right on this crucial business of measuring greenhouse gas emissions in all the current and proposed projects. We are already experiencing the effects of these greenhouse gas emissions and the resulting climate change. We need to act now. In July, the Montana District Court uh, judge issued an order that we know about Held v. Montana, which required DEQ um, to, uh, and compelled them to um, <laughs> Uh, immediately considered climate change in its environmental analysis under MEPA. DEQ has the tools to consider climate change already, uh, such as the, social, the federal social cost of greenhouse gas analysis, which has been alluded to several times tonight, um, the Montana climate assessment, um, which was actually written by uh, several people in this room. Um, these tools are, are have been developed and are used to determine the social cost associated with every ton of greenhouse gas that a company um, is requesting to add to the already saturated atmosphere. In this process, it's crucial to evaluate from the well to the end user. I'd like to talk specifically just as an example about the Laurel plant. Um, the Laurel methane plant. It's been estimated that it will be, and I believe permitted for to some extent, I should use that word perhaps, um, 780,000 tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions. That's a staggering number. But if you look at the work done by Alvarez et al., you have to also include um, additional amounts it's estimated that 2.3% of US gross production of methane is emitted into the atmosphere prior to any use of it. At this rate, supply chain methane emissions nearly double the short-term climate impacts of the combustion of methane for energy. So if you do the math, you take 780,000 tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions times two, you get 1,560,000 um, tons per year. If you use the federal uh, social analysis cost tool, that comes out to $296 million a year in social cost. $296 million a year in social cost per the federal tool. 
which has been in use for many years. Now that's a seriously staggering number. Now there have been independent studies done in the, in the recent years by Vibrant Clean Energy, for example, that analyzed all the other options to methane peaker plants and uh, other green, other um, fossil fuel based energy production. Um, it's called the Affordable and Reliable Decarbonization Pathways for Montana, where there's not even considered. The social cost of those are a, a small fraction of what this Laurel methane plant um, will have on the people of Montana and on, on the world. We need to address um, climate analysis for the entire lake, for, from the well to the end user. And per the, per the uh, health case, um, every additional ton of greenhouse gas pollution matters. Each new ton is causing harm and should be mitigated. DEQ is in charge of doing this. DEQ is required to measure this. I urge you to act promptly. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Tears. Katie Harrison, one second chance. <laughs> Derp tried twice. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Harrison. Thanks. I'm a little bit more prepared. Um, Katie Harrison, I have an organization called Sustainable Billings, uh, but I am speaking just on my own behalf today. Um, I have about 100 points that I would like to make. Um, but I know there's a lot of people in this room that really want to talk, and um, so I'll try to just get to it. Um, in no particular order. Can I yeah. You're last, so you can. You can. Yeah. Okay. I'm last. Oh, yeah. but there's not people online that yeah. are using to talk. Yeah, you, oh. we'll double your minutes. You get eight minutes. Oh, no, no, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. 100 points speed. I work right? better under pressure. Um, well, speaking of pressure, you know, I had actually a, a big event this uh, weekend. Uh, I only found out about this hearing on Friday. I think that's because it was only announced to the public on Wednesday of last week. Today is Monday. That gave uh, people, and I don't have children, uh, for example, or anyone I'm taking care of other than myself and my animals, uh, but I had stuff going on this weekend. So that gave me all of, I think, uh, four hours to prepare for this. If you really value public comment, convince us of that. Don't give us 24 hours max to coordinate. And, and I'm amazed and I'm so proud of Billings. 100 people or so in the room, at least 50 online that I think I'm aware of. That's incredible. I mean, if we were given a month's notice, maybe there would be about 1,000 people in this room and maybe we don't want that. Uh, and the, the hearings would go on for days. But I think that shows that um, People know what this hearing is, is all about. And someone stated it earlier, please make this a democratic um, decision-making process and not that of one or two people that are maybe weighing in via dollars. Um, this is all of our lives at hand here. That is the real cost. No fancy car that a paycheck will afford you today is worth the decisions that are potentially going to be made through the quote unquote modernization of MEPA. The only modernization of MEPA should be updating it according to the science that has existed for decades now. If that's what we mean by wanting to modernize MEPA, it should be holy smokes. We have not updated it since the 70s or 80s and all of this new science has come out since then. If modernization means shortcuts, then that's a blatant lie. And I hope that the fact that this room is full uh, is, is uh, evidence of the fact that we will hold elected officials and hired officials. I don't understand how all of this stuff works and is tied in and who's elected and who's being paid. I don't know. All I know is that 
I'm desperate for our voices to count and for science to matter because uh, this is the only earth we have. We don't get a second chance at this. And someone mentioned Mother Earth is barking and she really, really is barking loud. We can't afford another unplanned uh, catastrophic event. So thank you all very much for really listening to our words and uh, thank you everyone in this room for, for chiming in today. Thank you. Round for online, anyone who would like an opportunity. Otherwise, we'll wrap up. All right. Uh, so, in closing, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity uh, for you to, for, for us to gather your input. I have pages of notes, and I really appreciate it. Uh, as I said, the next steps will be two more public meetings. As I said, this is not your only opportunity. Our online portal accepts comments. And uh, two more two more meetings. <laughs> oh, and then the, we did schedule, thank you, Rebecca. We did schedule our online, our virtual only meeting, which is November 1st. So you have notice, it's out of ways. And uh, please join us in that and share your thoughts. I appreciate the respectful nature that you shared your ideas today, your thoughts, and, and I do appreciate how much energy you put into it. And um, with that, I'll close for the evening. Thank you.